it, it's a very long title because I wanted to have all the buzzwords um, in it. Um, but I mean, uh, I'm sure lots of people have taught uh, uh, taught people how to uh, encode things digitally, to create digital scholarly editions, um, etc. Um, and I've been doing this for the last three years. I should start my timer, otherwise you're going to yell at me when I go over time. There we go. Um, uh, uh, I've been doing this for the last three years at Newcastle, and um, uh, I thought, oh, I should I should reflect on on what I've learned about it. So, so we have a sort of digital digital ped pedagogy uh, kind of talk. Um, uh, this module cell three four one seven dissertation colon digital edition. Um, uh, hasn't just been taught by me, I'm the module leader of it, I do uh, a lot of the work, but uh, my colleague Dr. Uh, Aditi Nafti provides the uh, opening training in editorial theory for it. Uh, Dr. Melanie uh, Wood, who's uh, one of our special collections archivists, uh, does a workshop teaching students about how to handle special collections materials, as well as a bit more book history, paper folding exercises, and that kind of things. Um, uh, however, Aditi is on uh, maternity leave at the moment, and Kuisa Whelan uh, uh, this year and next is maternity cover for uh, Aditi. Um, and I make a note about hosting there in terms of collaboration, because it took me a year and a half to get my uh, uh, IT services, NUIT, to collaborate with the di digital library people in the library in order to have a virtual machine to host TEI Publisher on it um, to publish the students' work. Um, uh, and I very much didn't want it to be that I set up my own virtual machine and put TEI Publisher on it, which of course I could have done in a few minutes, but you know, I wanted to get the institution to buy into it. Um, uh, for reasons I might explain later. Um, so, uh, in a school of English, the standard form of capstone sort of project that the, the students do is a long form essay. Um, this takes two semesters. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's a 10,000 word essay, but it's exactly what they've been doing all of their career it, as undergraduates. It's just sort of three times longer than what they've done previously. Um, uh, the, the, in the, in the, the long-form essay, they have a 10% project plan with the annotated bibliography. They mostly get help from a single supervisor for uh, the, the whole year, um, book meetings with them, I think about six or eight hours of meetings total, something like that. Um, I'm always much more generous with the ones that come to me because they're either doing medieval stuff or digital stuff. And, you know, why wouldn't you want to spend an extra hour or two talking to a student about that? Um, the digital edition uh, uh, dissertation capstone project, also two semesters, it gets a lot more front-loaded training in editorial theory and practical training in TEI, text encoding initiative uh, encoding. They have a project planned as, as well, but it doesn't count towards their marks. It's a formative one, so they just get feedback on it. Um, and 50% then for the digital edition, which is 5,000 uh, words worth of work, and 50% for their introduction to the digital edition. And they usually get two supervisors, a DT and I, um, though we would co-op someone else if it was in something we felt we couldn't uh, uh, advise on. Um, plus they have an advisor in special collections, the archivist there, Melanie Wood. Um, uh, plus they have timetabled supervisory meetings instead of having to email their supervisor and say, oh, are you free for a meeting this day or that day? Um, we just timetable for them because we think that it will be better for them. So about those assessments, uh, they have that formative project plan with an annotated bibliography, as you might expect. But one of the things they do in that is at that, that's the point at which they tell us what is the text that they're going to be working on. The text they work on come from our own special collections in the Newcastle Library. Um, so the things they've chosen are polemical pamphlets, poetry anthologies, plays, treaties, that kind of stuff. Often, like with a play, they can choose one act of the play, for example. Um, we don't want them spending their time doing the whole um, play. Uh, they also give us a summary of the editorial work they're going to do, the uh, sort of theoretical approach they're taking to their editing, as well as the assumed audience for the edition. Um, uh, they provide an annotated bibliography, as the long-form essay does. 
And there's a 50% uh, introduction to uh, the digital edition, which is basically a traditional introduction to a scholarly edition with all of the, the sort of you know, notes on the text and all that kind of stuff that you would expect in a, 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 a typical critical um, editorial introduction. But they also specify uh, their editorial uh, approach, provide you know, a certain amount of background um, because they've had to research that because this is a text in a context that they're probably very unfamiliar with. Um, but also they have a specific section on uh, uh, their encoding and editorial decisions and how those are mirrored um, to each other that we recommend that they have that you might not get in a traditional um, uh, uh, edition. Um, students choose the intended audience. They have free choice in, in who their uh, edition is aimed at. Often they choose academics and it's a typical scholarly digital edition then. Um, the, about 40% of them choose an undergraduate audience, so they're basically creating it for themselves and people like them. Some of them have gone a bit earlier than that, so before undergraduate A-level in the UK. And others have sort of said, no, this is an edition destined generally for the, you know, the, the public at large, the general public. Um, and that, of course, then is reflected in the encoding that they do and the uh, work that they do. And so that's 5,000 words worth of work, and that is very consciously phrased because how do you determine what a certain number of words worth of work is? You know, transcribing uh, and editing a text um, isn't the same number of words work as writing the text to begin with, but it is a, an intellectual activity that takes a lot of work um, as we all know. Um, so we have to balance the choice of text because they often want to do a complete section or a complete text uh, with then the addition of editorial notes and the extent of the markup. So some of them do very richly detailed markup for the first third of their text and then just slowly stop and have much less detailed markup. But that's to balance and they explain that in that section in their editorial introduction. Um, but we expect sort of minimal levels of TI encoding in the first uh, 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 case anyways. So what do they get? They get uh, four two-hour seminars on the history of editing, editorial theory, editorial tasks, and a starting to think about what that means to be digital. They get a one three-hour workshop in special collections. Um, they get five three-hour workshops on XML and TEI markup. Don't tell my head of school that it's three hours because they assume workshops are one hour. Um, and, and so this makes it economically viable. Um, and they also have five one hour, usually joint, not always actually a full hour, um, supervisory meetings. Um, uh, the long form essay gets a few extra hours of research skills and advice on how to structure a long essay, but they're basically doing what they've already been doing before. So, what TEI did they learn? You know, obviously, I could talk to you for literally weeks about the TEI. And last time I was in Cork, uh, last year, this time, I did it delirious with COVID, um, uh, not knowing I had COVID, because uh, I tested negative to begin with. Um, uh, and, and so they get, you know, week 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 are the TEI weeks, and they get an introduction to markup XML TEI, an introduction to TEI structure and metadata, various common editorial markup that you might put in a TEI digital edition. They get a week where we talk about, you know, named entities and names, people, places. And uh, week 11 is uh, publishing with TEI publisher, basically teaching them how to log in and how to drop and drag and drop their, their file into the little TEI publisher box. And it all, you know, um, usually works fine, but also shows them what it's going to look like and they can request me to make changes on their behalf. Um, uh, one of the, that top image on the left, which you can't read, uh, has a title called Moonlight Shadow uh, and a note that's appearing as a sort of tool tip when it's hovered over it. And, and that's one of the early uh, uh, encoding projects they do is to encode some lyrics. Um, and aside from that, you know, almost all of them seem to choose uh, music from the 80s. I don't know if they're pandering <laughs> to, to me and my tastes or, or not, but 
maybe that's just what's uh, uh, practical uh, for them. Um, uh, they start off looking at some TIXML and going, oh my god, there's no way I'm going to be able to read that. And then by like uh, week 11, they're completely au okay with it and, and, and happy to read it and have no problems. Uh, working with special collections is one of the best parts of, of this, that they are working with materials that are in our own special collections. Um, they get that special collections workshop, which gives them an introduction to special collections and archives, both the physical premises of it and how you go and use it, because no undergraduates ever use it. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, they also get a history of early printing, collation, binding, what makes a rare collection item and what we mean by that, words like rare, as well as um, a little bit of an introduction to uh, digitization. We take them to see the digitization suite and things um, and metadata creation and why that might be important. Um, when the students have chosen their special collection item that they're going to work on, if it's not already digitized, uh, Melanie Wood, our, our, our special collections archivist there, moves it to the top of the digitization queue for us. And so it normally gets done in a couple weeks um, after they have submitted their um, uh, 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 project plan. Um, uh, not in the previous years, but this year, next year, the students are providing uh, updated metadata for digitized objects to the library, so reducing the workload of the library. Of course, there's reading room staff and archivists on hand to answer any copy specific questions like, what's that word? And things like that for them. Um, but one of the benefits for special collections is they get a business case um, uh, justification. They get uh, a, a module you know, from the School of English using special collections. So it's, it's a critical business for the university um, that justifies their um, existence. Um, part of what they do is, is uh, 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 take the images that they make and put them in what we call our collections captured system. Um, it's really OCLC's content DM uh, hosting and, and uh, IIIF um, uh, system. Uh, and so to get facing page text and image, all they have to do is add a special fax uh, attribute to their page breaks um, where they put in the collection number colon and image number and magically TI Publisher will put that up as an image because I've told it to do so. Um, uh, and that all seems to work absolutely fine. Um, uh, now, uh, we have questions then about which XML editor one would use. I normally use Oxygen when teaching TEI, and that's because it's good, it's robust, etc. And Newcastle University has a classroom license, which means not only am I allowed to install it in uh, classrooms, but students are allowed to install it on their laptop um, uh, for a limited length of time for uh, the module. Um, we're considering in future iterations of moving to LeafWriter, um, which I can talk to you about loads. I did at the previous conference, the previous two days, I did a presentation about it uh, in the poster demo uh, session, um, uh, which sort of hides the tags from people and allows you to sort of highlight things and click buttons to add linked open data to it. And that's part of a, a big uh, melon funded project um, that I'm part of with Susan Brown and Diane Chikaki. Um, but I show them LeafRider, but I wait until sort of about week nine to show them LeafRider. And at that point, they're already so used to XML tags that they sort of prefer to see the XML tags. And when you tell people who don't know XML that, they're like, oh, no, that would never be possible. But you give them sort of 15 hours of training in XML and, and all of those worries seem to go away. But I like LeafWriter for certain types of projects, so who knows? Um, so what they do to upload it to TI Publisher is literally just take their well-formed, valid uh, 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 TI uh, file and uh, drag and drop it to the little upload box in the right-hand corner. Way it instantly appears in about three seconds in the list um, of, of all of the items on the site. They can also see all of the items by previous students on the module, which gives them a sense of, oh, I see, they've done this, and they can look at their XML and, and such. So 
you know, all of that's good. They can't see their editorial introductions because I haven't sort of built that into the template I give them to use. When they do that, it appears, you get text and image next to each other. You get things where you have, you know, um, line numbering of poems and there's some line bracing there that's not really uh, well displayed because it's just a, a dotted line in the margin. Um, and you can zoom in quite a lot on the images because these are high resolution, you know, TIFF files underneath this. And this one is especially important because this was cataloged um, uh, the, the di Diabola Boliad uh, was catalogued in our library's catalog as being 1677, which is what the Roman numerals there say. But it is, of course, because it mentions people who were not alive in 1677, it is actually from 1777. Um, and our student had proved that by looking at the prologue and some Garrick. Garrick wasn't around in 1677. It can't be from then. And wrote to uh, the archivist, who then changed the metadata. And it was all a very good teaching moment. So I wanted to include that slide just so I could say that. Um, so you have things things like, you know, out of the box for them where they've put a note in their TDI and it has produced a, a, a note element which then t turns into a tooltip pop-up, but then also the footnote is repeated at the bottom of the page. You know, that might be a bit redundant on a very short page like this, but it, it you know, it's okay as a way to do things, you know. I'm not gonna argue for it as a, a UX kind of choice, really, but I'm too lazy to change it. We similarly, if they have information about people, places, organizations, etc., and they've done that as a TI person element and then pointed to it from their text, it gets sort of underlined in red right there. That's the word Cresswell, which is a, a character's name in this uh, satire against women, a horribly misogynistic play that a young woman wanted to do on, on my module. Um, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, it pops up in, in interesting information that they've put in about that um, uh, person. And, you know, that nice little red underlining gives them us the ability to see that. Of course, that's not how it was when TEI out of the box did it. Um, a previous uh, uh, iteration of the module, one of the students has said, oh, I want all the personal names underlined in red, you know, because that, that you know, feels like, you know, what's important to me. And so because TEI Publisher is built on the TEI processing model, where you're able to change the ODD, um, one document does it all, TEI customization, you're able to go through a menu item and sort of click and say, oh, purse name elements, when you have a purse name element, look to see whether it's already inside a person or whether it's in the body of the text. And if it's in the body of the text, one of the things you do is make it read and underlined and also go and get any information from the person to have it be a, a tooltip or uh, alternate as the um, uh, uh, TI publisher um, terms it. So students are initially hesitant in a school of English of doing anything digital because that sounds like coding, which means programming to them, which is hard. <laughs> All of the students who've taken the module, by the end of it, tell me they're really, like they might just be telling it to me because, you know, it's me, but, but they tell me they're, they're overjoyed with it, that they really enjoyed it, um, especially the skills training and the sort of demystification of how digital editions and things work. Low enrollment is a problem, and I'm not sure the best ways to encourage uh, people to uh, uh, take it when there isn't really a pathway through our degrees in the School of English of people doing digital assessments. Um, there, there are bits here and there, but they don't really join up. All of the students taking it have gone on to postgraduate study, including MAs in English, publishing, book history, and uh, this year one going to data science for humanities. Um, so I take that as a really good success marker. My, my head of school, when they look at the enrollment figures, might not uh, do that. I'm running short of time, so I will um, uh, hurry up and say um, that the reason we teach this module is that we think digital editors of the future really need some solid understanding of digital text. Um, 
the questions we have is, should we train them only to create digital scholarly editions? Should we be giving them all this scholarly editing uh, uh, front-loaded material that we give them? Um, we tend to think it gives them a bedrock of history for them to decide their own editorial approach and audience. Um, uh, but who knows? Um, uh, should we teach editing and XML and TEI, or should we just teach editorial tasks? We could say these are the tasks of an editor, and here's one way of doing those through an interface, and maybe show them some other ways. Um, now that better tags off editors like LeafWriter exist, do we need to teach them XML? And I've made the point in various publications that TEI is not XML. It's just currently serialized as XML. Um, you can teach TEI without teaching the serialization of XML, but it's harder than just explaining the tags. In fact, when I was teaching here with Tricia um, last uh, a year, one of the things is we taught them TEI customization before we taught them TEI markup. I think that's a bit hard, you know, but, you know, it, it, you could go farther with that and teach them how all sorts of things in the TEI work before teaching them about the formal syntax of it. And teaching them TEI gives a solid heuristic framework for exploring textual phenomena. And basically we ask them, well, how would you mark this up? Um, so I have no idea how to uh, uh, make more students take my module. This year I tried putting up posters just at their module choice uh, point, which sort of said, have you considered not doing the long form essay? <laughs> you know, you could do this module and said, no computer or editing skills required. Um, but it doesn't seem to have helped so far. Um, so I'm, I'm open to... Uh, uh, you know, suggestions with that. Um, I have maybe minimized how much labor and individual uh, work it takes to do the module to my school, partly because when they're sort of totting up numbers of hours per number of students, I, I don't want them to go, oh, we'll cancel that. I'd rather donate my, my extra hours to doing that. Um, so generally, conclusions, last slide. Um, uh, we think teaching uh, editorial background generally creates better rounded uh, student editors. We think teaching XML and TI also provides them a useful way to think and talk about textual phenomena. Um, we think using a tags on editor like Oxen ends up being easier for students once they, they've got used to it. We think collaborating with our special collections is definitely key to the module. So far we've been lucky with the institutional threat. And I've not solved the problem about digital hesitancy. Um, I'm trying to change modules that I don't run earlier to include more digital things. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Sorry.